Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we want to hear from you, uh, not just this afternoon, but this entire conference. Lord, we want to know your heart. We want to know your mind. And so we pray, Lord, that you would come and, well, settle my heart and my mind, but all of us as well, that, Lord, you'd come and fill us all afresh with your Holy Spirit, that you'd give us ears to be able to hear what you are saying to us, what you want us to hear these uh, two days. Please anoint me with your Holy Spirit that I would have your anointing and power upon me that the words I bring might be spirit and life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Isaiah 40, verse 11 is where I'm starting, but I'm going to be going elsewhere. Isaiah 40, verse 11, and it says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Now, I use the New King James, and the word he uses there is bosom, and carry them in his bosom. Now, I don't tend to use bosom as part of my vocabulary. When I hold somebody to me, I don't say I'm holding them to my bosom. What do we say? We're holding somebody to our, to our heart. And that, for that reason, I like the NIV rendition of this verse, which says, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. God's heart is for the sheep. He is a shepherd to the sheep and he loves his sheep. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. God's heart is for the sheep, and sheep need a shepherd. Now, in my box here, does anybody want to hazard a guess as to what that is? It's a sheep's head, absolutely. Um, Yes, this, this, is, <laughs> this, this was found on, uh, in Dartmoor National Park. Uh, it's not been cleaned by human hands, it's just been cleaned by nature. It was found this way. And uh, what can you tell me about this sheep? Uh, it's dead. It's dead. <laughs> That's about the only thing that we can all agree upon, I'm sure. But what was its name? To which flock? Did it belong? How did it come to be alone on the moors? Did it get separated from its flock by accident? Maybe it got driven away by the other sheep, or did it just wander off of its own accord? Did it fall prey to wild animals, maybe? You know, sheep have any number of predators in different countries. In this country, sheep in the UK fall foul to foxes, badgers, eagles sometimes, and of course domestic, domestic dogs. So maybe a badger found a way into the field, or maybe a fox seized its opportunity. I don't know. Perhaps it got sick and died. Sheep suffer from many sicknesses. There's a sickness called grass staggers that sheep suffer from, which is an insufficiency of magnesium that it's getting from the pasture, and this deficiency can cause just sudden death of a sheep. There are lots of bacterial sicknesses that sheep suffer from. Uh, I had an interesting time researching those. And uh, uh, some of these bacterial sicknesses can cause them, the sheep to become dull, and then they fall behind from the flock, and then they eventually die. Maybe that's what happened to this sheep. One bacterial sickness results from sheep wandering into unhealthy crops, rape fields, or uh, turnip fields. And as a result of the bad diet, they get a sickness and die. Also from bad diet is something called bloat. Bloat is when a sheep wanders into a patch of clover and causes gases to build up inside the stomach, so I'm told, which if not treated will result in the sheep's uh, death. 
And the treatment is quite severe. You pierce the stomach and then you release all the gas. And sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind to help sheep. Now the sickness is called John's disease, which is brought on by stress. And uh, there are any number of sicknesses derived from ticks where a parasite attaches itself to the sheep and the sheep weakens and dies. Then there's hypothermia, dysentery, mastitis, kidney disease, liver disease, muscle disease, arthritis. In short, sheep are vulnerable and need great care. And sheep need a shepherd to take care of them. So now I've got to ask the question, <clears throat> where was the shepherd of this sheep? The shepherd that would have called the sheep by its name and steered it out of danger. The shepherd that would have left the 99 to find the one and restore it to the flock. The shepherd that would have lifted the sheep out of the ditch from where it had fallen. The shepherd that would have bound its broken leg, then raised it on its shoulders and carried it home. The shepherd who would fought off the wild animal. The shepherd who would have made certain the sheep were safely kept in the sheepfold at night. The shepherd who would have led the sheep away from clover, rape and turnips. The shepherd who would have spotted the signs of sickness, applied the balm or pierced the stomach. Where was the shepherd who should have loved this sheep, tended this sheep and watched over this sheep? Maybe it was off sleeping. Maybe that's where the shepherd was. Maybe it had better things to do that day. Maybe it hit five o'clock and he thought, well, it's clocking off time, I'll leave the sheep to their own devices. Maybe he had given the sheep its feed and thought, well, that's my job done, given it its meal, now I can go and do what I want to do. Maybe he was just an under-shepherd and thought, well, they have the chief shepherd to take care of them, so I can just relax about the matter. Or maybe the sheep didn't have a shepherd. Maybe it had just a hireling, a hired hand who didn't really care about the sheep. This poor, lonely, defenceless sheep. Who's know, who knows what its story was, or indeed what it could have been. But there alone it died on the moors. Now, let me put that there. This is all symptomatic of what is happening in our churches. Sheep are getting sick and no one is picking up on it and tending to that sickness. Sheep are wandering off, maybe due to church splits or congregational hurts uh, or simple neglect. Sheep are falling foul to predators, false doctrine, false teachers. Not only because they're not being rightly taught or fed, but because they're not being rightly warned as well and because they're not being protected. They might be getting some good food from the pulpit, but then it gets mixed with the rape, turnip and clover of liberal theology. Yes, on one hand, they're being fed, husbands love your wives, wives submit your husbands. But then on the other hand, they're being told that same-sex marriage can be blessed by the Lord when scripture says it's an abomination. On one hand, they're being fed, God loves his people. And then on the other hand, they're being told that God has done away with his covenant people Israel when scripture says that they're the apple of his eye. And so disease settles in, a dullness settles in, and eventually a spiritual death settles in. And so you have, as we have, uh, people living directly opposite us on our road who once were incredibly alive and active in the local church but have been hurt, abused and neglected and now they don't attend church anymore. And what's more, they refuse to accept that anything is wrong because they have, been bought, they have bought into the lie that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You know, that wolf, the devil, has separated more sheep from the flock, brought back more backsliding, sickness and death through that lie that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian uh, in recent years uh, than any other method he's employed, I think. 
It's a doctrine of demons. It comes right from the pit of hell. But where are the shepherds? Where are the shepherds? Where are the lovers of their souls? I'm going to go to a familiar passage, uh, Ephesians 4. Uh, Bob, you taught on this last year, I think. Wherever he is, yes. <laughs> Ephesians 4, we all know it. I'm going to read verses 7 and 8 and 11 and 12, Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captive, cap captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Then verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So Paul is talking about gifts that Jesus Christ has given to the body of Christ. Now there are many gifts, healing, administrations, hospitality, words of knowledge, tongues and so forth, but some gifts are people themselves. And you have here apostles and prophets whose gift was to lay the foundation of the church. Then you have evangelists whose gift is to bring people into the church to make sheep. Then you've got pastors and teachers whose gift it is to shepherd and feed the sheep. God so loves his sheep. God so wants his sheep to be taken good care of that the Lord desired a, designed a specific gift, a gift that would be a person who would love his sheep and take care of his sheep. And that is the pastor teacher. God wants each church to have a shepherd. Your congregation may be the sheep of his pasture, but he appoints, he appoints under-shepherds. He appoints you to be his under-shepherds, to oversee his flock, to tend them, to feed them, to love them. Just as he is the lover of your soul, he wants you, pastor teacher, to be the lover of their souls. Now, in my opinion, the word pastor suffers from the same problem as the word baptism. Its meaning has been obscured. The word baptism, of course, comes from the Greek to mean immersion. But due to church tradition and not wanting to give offence, the meaning was obscured through a transliteration from baptizo to baptism instead of a translation to immersion. Similarly, the word rendered pastor comes from the Greek to mean shepherd. And ever since the Geneva Bible of 1587, the word hasn't been translated into the English shepherd. The word has been translated into the Latin, pastor. Thus, baptism and shepherd, their meanings have been obscured, with the possible exception of the English Standard Version, which chooses to use the word shepherd. Well done, the ESV. The consequence of this, of course, is that instead of having uh, shepherd Bob or... Uh, Shepherd Kevin and Shepherd Matt, we have Pastor Bob, we have Pastor Kevin, we have Pastor Matt. And so it becomes a title instead of a description of the gift and the calling. Then what happens is people adopt the title the same way someone becomes a reverend or a manager or a director. And then the problem arises, people get appointed to the position of pastor, but they don't have the gift or the calling of a shepherd. They may be a good teacher, but being a good teacher doesn't make you a shepherd. You know, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, um, it has a similar list of gifts that are people, and among those is the gift of teacher. So and there's a difference between a teacher and a pastor teacher. You know, every shepherd is a teacher, but not every teacher is a shepherd. Now, it's because of this that sheep get neglected. They wander off and are not sought after and brought back to the fold. They become vulnerable to false teachers and predatory preachers. They grow sick, go unloved, needs uh, fail to be recognised and uh, tended to. And because they have a person who bears the title pastor overseeing them but doesn't have the heart or the calling of a shepherd, they fall by the wayside. So this is what I want to say to you this morning, and this is what I think the Lord wants to say to you this morning. 
The Lord does not want pastors. The Lord wants shepherds. The Lord does not want pastors. The Lord wants shepherds. The Lord loves his sheep. And he's looking for under-shepherds who will also love his sheep with the same heart that he has for the sheep. You know, Calvary Chapel is good at teaching the word. That's the name of our conference, Teach the Word. But are we good at loving the sheep? That's the question I put to you this morning. Now, it might sound like I'm being down on those who are elders among us or hold some other leadership uh, position. Forgive me if that's the way it sounds. That's, that's not my intent. In our church, I serve as pastor and as an elder alongside Ian. And together we share the same authority but slightly different giftings. And we've also welcomed Dennis and Johnny, who's not here, as assistant elders. So together, we four form an eldership. We're all elders. And the word of the Lord says to you as pastors and leaders, in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 4, the elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So to everybody, God is asking you to be a shepherd. Now let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with Ezekiel 34 as well. I'm going to read the first 10 verses. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. Now, the idea behind the term shepherd here is you being used both of civil leaders as well as religious leaders. And in this passage, the shepherds of Israel are called to account by the law because they have neglected the sheep, and not only that, they have abused the sheep. Now, when a preacher stands up in a room and reads this passage in a room of uh, people that purport to be shepherds themselves, uh, it doesn't bode well. You might be inclined to think it's time to put my tin hat on and button down the hatches because I'm in for a rough ride. Let me just reassure you, I have no intention to point the finger. I have no intention to criticise or condemn this morning, this afternoon. So you can take off your tin hats and uh, climb out of your foxholes. But that said, the warning does hold weight if any among us are neglecting their sheep or indeed abusing the sheep that the Lord has entrusted to our care. Now, there are two things that I really want to draw from this passage, uh, two principles of shepherding. The first is that the first duty 
of a shepherd is to feed the sheep, and the second duty of a shepherd is a personal care of the sheep. And that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my time this afternoon. So let's just read um, verses uh, 2 and 3 again. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. So the first thing is, the first duty of the shepherd is to feed the sheep. Now in Israel, you had an abundance of green pasture in springtime after the grain had been harvested and after the poor had granted opportunity to glean the fields the shepherds would be allowed in to be able to uh, feed their flock with whatever remained when this food was exhausted pasture was sought elsewhere now, Israel is not blessed with the green hills and fields that England is rather you look at a hill and often it appears barren and empty and so it's only as you get closer that you see these little tufts of, uh, of growth where um, food is. And hence you, would, you couldn't leave your sheep to pasture in the same way that you can do in this country. You'd need a shepherd to lead them to where the food is. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And in the wilderness of Judea in spring, uh, he gets carpeted in places with grass. But as it comes to summer, it turns into hay and is fit for the sheep to eat. But... As the food slowly dries up, so the shepherds are forced to take the flock uh, to further afield to find more uh, food. Hence why Joseph was sent by his father Jacob to check on his brothers who were feeding their father's flock in Shechem. He first went to Hebron where he thought they were, but, they had been re but then he was redirected to Dothan because they had to move on to somewhere else to find fresh pasture. In 1 Chronicles 4, Verses 39 and 40, it tells us of Simeon's search for green pasture. It says, So they went to the entrance of Gedor, as far as the east side of the valley, to seek pasture for their flocks. And they found rich, good pasture, and the land was broad, quiet, and peaceful, for some Hamites formerly lived there. So the shepherd needs to hunt for the good food for the sheep. Sheep need to be led to good food. Otherwise, they'll eat any type of junk. And YouTube is awash with teachers with high-sounding messages, but their content is junk, a bad diet that will lead to disease and death. Now, as shepherds, we need to hunt out the green pastures, the good food. And that means labouring in the word of God, uh, walking long and hard through commentaries and other people's teaching to get the very best for your sheep. But now, this is important. You can feed your sheep a good a good sermon that is doctrinally accurate, scripturally pure, one that has been derived from labouring long in the commentaries, but is still spiritually dead. You see, just by itself, the word is, is, is knowledge. And knowledge, as we know from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, knowledge puffs up. You need a word that is not just biblical, but you need a word that comes from the Spirit as well, because it's the Spirit that brings life. God's sheep, which he has entrusted to you, are spiritual sheep. And as a result, they need a spiritual diet. Thus, you need to hear from the Holy Spirit what you are to say to your sheep. So, to highlight this, I just want to... I'm going to come back to Ezekiel 34, but I'm going to go to Mark 6. And there's some things that uh, I want to draw from Mark 6. This is the story of the uh, feeding of the 5,000. So, again, another passage that we're going to be very familiar with. So, starting off at verse 30 of Mark 6, we read, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all the things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. So Jesus saw the tiredness and the hunger in his disciples, so he led them to a place where they might 
rest. And there they might be able to, to not only rest, but have food. And no doubt Jesus was tired and hungry as well after a long day of ministry. So here we see Jesus caring for his immediate sheep. The story goes on, verses 33 and 34. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities, and they arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. So there he is, wanting to give his own sheep a chance to, to rest and recuperate and to feed, and suddenly there's this, all these other sheep that start arriving. And what's more, these are sheep without a shepherd. And uh, notice Jesus didn't drive them away, saying, off with you, it's my downtime. Jesus didn't say, it's Monday, it's my day off, what are you doing? Jesus was a shepherd, and he had compassion on these sheep, on these children of Israel. They were like a sheep without a shepherd. And you know that you're a shepherd when you see lost sheep or sheep without a shepherd and your heart goes out to them. That's the heart of a shepherd. And so with sacrificial love, he lays aside his hunger and his tiredness, almost putting his food down maybe, and he began to teach them many things we see. John 10 verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus set aside what he wanted to do and he put the needs of the sheep first. And a shepherd has a sacrificial love for his sheep. He lays aside his life for the sheep. And it may be that someone calls you out of the blue uh, or someone turns up on your doorstep at the end of your day or on your day off and you're a shepherd and you're tired. But they're your sheep. And they're hungry. You need to be a shepherd to their soul. Now, there are problem people who can take advantage of you, and we need to be wise about them and identify them and allow ourselves not to be burnt out. I'm not saying that's not the case. But when there is a genuine need, you should be genuinely available, I believe. I remember a few years ago, we were on holiday with Debbie and Dan. We went to Wales and uh, finally got the children to bed. Between us, we've got eight children, so you can imagine how wonderful that was and how tired and hungry we were. And uh, we set up the board game, we got the drinks, we got the snacks, we were ready to play, and Dan got a phone call. And uh, I don't know quite who it was, but it was somebody back at Bristol, somebody, well, sheep without a shepherd, I think. Is that right? And Dan put down the drink and the snacks and the game, and he went into the kitchen, and for the next hour and a half, he ministered to this woman, wasn't it? That's the heart of a shepherd. Putting aside what you want to do, no matter how well-deserved and earned it is, and putting the sheep first. <coughs> so reading on, uh, verse 35. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. So we see here the disciples don't really have a heart of a shepherd just yet. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. Oh dear, here comes a ministry opportunity. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed, broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. So the need of the shepherd outweighed the resources of the so-called under-shepherds, these disciples. The disciples were unable to feed the sheep from their own resources. They did not have the means to be able to satisfy the need of these sheep. But praise the Lord, the chief shepherd has boundless resources, amen. Only when they brought the little that they had to Jesus was he able to break it and multiply it and feed all the sheep. 
And we as under-shepherds need to learn to rely upon the Lord for the necessary food to be able to feed the sheep. You do not have enough resources in and of yourself, no matter how good a student you are, to be able to feed the sheep. That's why we need a spiritual word from heaven. That's why we need to hear from the master, the chief shepherd, to know exactly what is going to feed those sheep. Now, um, a few days ago, I came to a blank piece of paper with just a skull in my hand. Uh, that blank page was very scary. And a few days before that, I didn't even have a sheep skull. <laughs> I went on holiday a couple of weeks back to the Peak District, and I spent the entire weekend looking for a sheep skull. Couldn't find one. Had to order one online. Um, but there I was, blank piece of paper and the sheep skull. But the Lord brought the increase because I waited upon him for the message that he wanted me to share. And in this day and age, a Bible-based message is something of a rare thing, isn't it? Uh, we're living in the days of Amos 8, verses 11 and 12, which says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Does that not speak of lost, shepherd, lost sheep looking for a shepherd, someone to feed them? I'm persuaded that mere knowledge of the word is not enough. You need a spiritual living word. And that only comes from the master himself, the chief shepherd. We should be asking ourselves the questions, you know, this is the passage for this week, I'm working through this book, but what does the Lord want to say to the sheep? From this passage. Not what excites me and what I found out to satisfy my intellect, but what does the Lord want to say? What challenge, what application does he want me to bring? Now, that sort of thing doesn't come from a commentary. That only comes from spending time in the Lord's presence, spending time in prayer. It means setting aside time, getting down on your knees, seeking him, making sure that you are spiritually strong and in a right position, first of all, to hear from the Lord, then waiting upon him until he speaks to you and waiting upon him and waiting upon him. Meditate upon the passage. So you are not only rightly dividing the word, but also you are rightly inspired by the Holy Spirit. As shepherds, we need to be in the habit of fasting. Let me say that again. As shepherds, we need to be in the habit of fasting, saying, I'm not going to eat until you speak to me, Lord. There is something about fasting mingled with faith that it gives you an enhanced uh, communion with the Lord, opens up the channels. He sees your determination, your desire to have something spiritual for the sheep. And so as you, as you deny yourself, the Lord is somehow able to enrich you with so much more. My words are nothing. You know, they're here today, gone tomorrow. But the words of God impact the soul and transform lives and provide a lasting sustenance. You see, the sheep don't only need teaching. They need a living, breathing word from God that will minister to their spirits, that will sustain their souls. As disciples, as the disciples couldn't feed the 5,000 without reliance upon Jesus, so you can't feed your sheep without reliance upon Jesus. And oftentimes, the more a message has cost you in time spent in prayer and fasting, the more it will feed the sheep. Now, it's not just the message, it's the messenger too. You could have two men teaching exactly the same message, preparing exactly the same meal, verbatim. Only one is in a normal state of being, and the other is spirit-filled, having laboured in prayer and fasting. And his deliverance will carry the anointing and the blessing and will have power and impact lives. The other person, not so much. Thus, you need to spend time in the Lord's presence, not only to receive a living word, but also so that you can deliver that living word, so you can be a living messenger. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle, aside from the resurrection, of course, that is recorded in all four Gospels. And in John's account of the feeding of the 5,000, which is found in John 6, we are told the crowds came... I wonder whether that reference is right, actually. I think it is. 
We are told the crowds came again the following day, but on the following day, Jesus refused them. Jesus was no fool. He didn't allow himself to be taken advantage of. Instead, he sought to give them spiritual food instead of physical food that perishes. Describing himself as the bread of heaven. And he said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. To which the religious leaders, leaders uh, objected. And it's at that point, of course, many of the disciples fell away. Now to his disciples afterwards, in verse 63, he said this. Does this offend you? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. The words Jesus speaks are spirit and life. These are the words I want to hear, but these are the words that the sheep want to hear and need to hear. So we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood. We need to abide in Christ to have that life-giving message. Now, if we can pop back to Ezekiel 34, the second thing that I want to say is the second duty of a shepherd. Can we read verse 4? Verse 4 of Ezekiel 34 says, The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force, cruelty, you have ruled them. Force and cruelty, you have ruled them. So the second duty of a shepherd is personal care of the sheep. Again, something that the shepherds of Israel in Ezekiel's day had failed to do. Not only had they failed to feed the sheep, they had uh, not attended to them with any personal care. Let's not follow in their footsteps. Now, the ancient shepherds of Israel uh, would live with their sheep. They would sleep with their sheep. They would be, quite literally, the the gate, the door to the sheepfold, as I'm sure we all know. Thus they would smell of the sheep. They would know each sheep by name. They would know their character, their strengths, their inclinations, their weaknesses. In other words, they were intimately acquainted with their sheep. They cared for them both individually and corporately. And I'm saying we should live and sleep with our sheep. That would give sort of safe, certain safeguarding problems, I'm sure. But we do need to be acquainted with our sheep. We need to know their names. We need to know what is going on in their life. Discern their strengths and their weaknesses. Watch out for those tendencies and inclinations that could be harmful in their lives. Take time to minister to them one-on-one. -on -one. The sheep need to know that they are loved and that they are valued. There were times Jesus ministered to the multitudes, like the feeding of the, uh, the 5,000, but there were plenty of times when he ministered to the one. Now, be it a Zacchaeus, who's just come down for a t from the tree, and he's going to go to his house for tea. There was a Samaritan woman by the well, and of course, Peter by the Galilee. And I can see that every one of those felt valued and loved because of the one-on-one -on -one time that Jesus spent with them. And if you spend one-on-one -on -one time with your sheep, they all feel valued and loved as well. And who here doesn't want to be valued and loved? Now, there are four examples of personal care that I'd like to just talk about. The first is after Sunday service. The second is over the phone. The third is in your home. And the fourth is in their home. Now, sometimes after Sunday service, sometimes it's a case of speaking to somebody after the service, asking them about their sick father or that they mentioned last week, or asking them about their exam that their child was taking earlier that week. But of course, to be able to do this, you need to study your sheep. You need to listen to your sheep. You need to get to know your sheep, to know what's going on in their lives, what matters to them. You can't go and ask them how things are doing if you don't know what they're doing. And this means shutting up and not always doing the talking. Switch off the ministry mode and learn to listen to your sheep. Find out what's on their heart and what matters to them. I'm always asking God to guide me uh, to the right people that I should speak to after Sunday service, those for whom God has something for me to impart, or simply those who need point of contact with the shepherd. Another type of personal care is over the phone. And sometimes it's just a case of making a simple phone call during the week. We had a pastor's huddle in Hastings 
I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago. I remember uh, Aaron was there, Bob was there, Barry was there, um, I was there. And uh, I remember f we were reflecting upon what had happened with COVID. And I remember Phil talking about how he found that because he couldn't see people face to face, he spent a lot more time making phone calls during that period of time. And he discovered that he could do so much more pastoring through a half an hour phone call than he could ever do in a day going around visiting people, or worse to those effects. And that really stayed with me, Phil. And uh, if the Lord brings someone to my heart or to my mind during the day, I quite often just give them a phone call just to see how they're doing, to check in on them. And that's because of how you pastored me. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm a plumber. Uh, so oftentimes, as I'm going from one job to the other, I've got some downtime in the van as I'm driving from to and fro, so that's a time to be able to call in on somebody and, and see how they're doing or they're on my mind. Or if the job's not too difficult, I might put the phone on speakerphone while I'm fixing a toilet or something like that. <laughs> I don't tell them I'm fixing a toilet. <laughs> they just hear the voice of the shepherd on the other end of the line. Now... You might question, well, is that an unction from the Lord? Should I call that person or not? But let me tell you, no one is ever displeased to hear my voice whenever I call them. Whether it's a divine appointment or just a social call, sheep like to know that they're on the mind and the heart of the shepherd. That you think about them, that you pray for them, that they matter to you. Sheep need to know that they, ma they matter and that they're loved. You know, I have a couple of friends who are Church of England ministers, and I don't know what sort of training they go to, but there seems to be something of an emotional reserve in them towards their congregation. I don't know whether that's universal, whether it's part of the training or not, but, for example, one of them, he has two Facebook accounts, one that he reveals to his congregation and the rest that he keeps private for his friends and his family. Now, it might be a safeguarding thing, I don't know, but... They always seem to be somewhat emotionally distant and reserved from their congregation. And I don't agree with that. The Lord loves us and is emotionally invested in us. And we should love our sheep and be emotionally invested in them. Now, it will cost you, and it is sacrificial love. And, you know, there'll be situations where you walk through, them, through uh, pain and tragedy with them, spend time and invest in them, and then one day they'll up and leave over one small matter of no importance. And it hurts. It hurts when they leave, when you've invested so much in them. And you feel that hurt, and you feel that hurt. But do you know what? I'd much rather feel the hurt than not care and be emotionally cut off. You might argue, well, I need to guard my heart. I say... Give your heart to the chief shepherd and let him guard your heart. You love the sheep. I was listening to something that Damien Carr was teaching uh, earlier this week. And he was said that in the early days of his ministry, at some point, he was meditating on a passage before the Lord. And the Lord said to him, you take care of the sheep and I'll take care of you. And he, that has stayed with him ever since. And that's a watchword of his ministry, he said. You take care of the sheep, and I'll take care of you. Another example of uh, personal care of the sheep is in your home. Sometimes it's a case of inviting the sheep into your life. Invite the sheep over for Sunday lunch. Arrange for a play date between your kids and their kids. Have a games night. Live with the sheep, the way the ancient shepherds did. You know, uh, over the Christmas period, Dennis... And Yvonne had a sheep over their house Christmas Eve, didn't you? Did he behave? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Christmas Day, we had four sheep over our house, didn't we? And on Boxing Day, you had three sheep over your house, didn't you, Ian and Francis? Of course, any sheep that come to our house have to contend with our children, so, you know, mixed blessing. <laughs> but uh, invite them into your life. Show them that they mean more than just a number on a Sunday morning. Then, when you need to correct them, they know it comes from a place of love. Then, when you need to bind them and it hurts, they know it's because you care, because you've already done the groundwork. 
And of course, another place that you can exercise personal care is in their home. Sometimes it's a case of going to visit them. And that can be for fellowship, and sometimes that can be for ministry. There's a lady called Monica, who's 97 years old. Uh, she moved from Dorset to Maidstone, and she lives in an annex in the back garden of her unbelieving daughter's house. She's never been to our church, as she's too frail to be able to attend. But when she needed fellowship, her friends from Dorset put a search in the web for churches in Maidstone. Now, if ever you put a search in the internet for a church, you know it's an absolute minefield. So they narrowed the church search parameters by putting in the term church, brackets, pre-tribulation rapture. <laughs> and guess which church came up? <laughs> so her friends contacted us, and as a church, we have been visiting her ever since. Sometimes it's Abby and myself, sometimes Ian and Francis, sometimes Yvonne. There's another lady called Amy that goes over and sees her as well. Um, she knows that she's loved, that she's valued, that she matters. And uh, every now and again, she'll give me a donation, give me a cheque for £50. And I take that money and I go and buy Christian tracks. And they're the tracks that we hand out on a Saturday morning when we go into Mason High Street to do some witnessing. And I have great joy in telling her that she single-handedly single funds the evangelism ministry of Calvary Chapel Maidstone. That visit means everything to her. That love for the sheep means everything for her. And it's no great ministry, it's just fellowship. But that's what she needs. Of course, sometimes the purpose for visiting your sheep in their home is for the purposes of ministry. And ministry might be counselling through some difficulty, of course. Ministry might be giving them guidance in a matter. Ministry might be weeping with them over some loss. Cry with your sheep. Putting your arm around them. Showing them that you love them. Whenever I find myself over someone's house, uh, ministering one-to-one -one on an issue, I always make sure that I'm praying hard beforehand, that I'm in the right place, that the channels to God are fully open. I'll listen very carefully to what they've got to say, and then as I get a sense of what I should be saying, I say, let's just pray again, because I want to be sure that what I'm saying comes from the Lord. And I always ask for a scripture. I want to give them a passage or a verse from the word of God so they've got something solid that they can anchor their souls into. And do you know what? The Lord always delivers. The Lord always gives me something, praise the Lord. I take care of the sheep. He takes care of me. Now, I'm probably teaching you to suck eggs. Um, you're all far more experienced than me, I'm sure. And uh, I'm sure I could learn a lot more from you than anything I can say up here. And I'd love to have some conversations afterwards with anybody who's got any insights that they'd like to share. I, I want to learn. I want to, get a, I want to be a better shepherd. Um, but as I wrap things up, you know, the great need in today's church is shepherds. Shepherds who love the sheep, who spend time with the sheep, who feed the sheep with life-giving messages from the chief shepherd himself, who defend the sheep, who lay down their life for the sheep. Why? Because sheep are dying out there through neglect and abuse. Let's not that happen on our watch. Let this not be our legacy of our ministry. You know, may our legacy be to echo the words of our Lord in Ezekiel 34, verses 15 and 16, where he says, I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down. I will seek what is lost and bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Amen. Father God, I pray that you would take this word and minister it to the hearts and the spirits of my brothers and sisters here. Lord, please give us your heart for the sheep. Lord, help us to care for them, love them, strive for a living word that's going to speak to their souls. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.